Dear friends, colleagues, dear brothers and sisters at the Connect Us International Human Rights Colloquium, firstly, let me just say that I've been following for years the colloquiums and I regret very much that I've not been able to join you personally, but I know the very important role this colloquial has played in terms of generating debates about improving our human rights practice on the one end, but more importantly also helping us get the right theoretical and narrative frames that are necessary to advance human rights. I've been asked to reflect a little bit about learnings from the anti-apartheid struggles and how that might be relevant today. The first issue that I want to raise is that when I reflect on some of the early activism, one of the issues with human rights campaigning is that those of us who are in the NGO movement who tend to be activists and so on have a challenge of being able to frame the demands in ways that are accessible to people. Uh, that is to say, to frame human rights demands in a way that actually speaks to the ordinary experience of people's day-to-day day -to -day lives, something that we struggle with. I remember my first march, the slogan at the French of the front of the march was, we want equality. By the time the slogan got to the back of the march, the kids were chanting, we want a color TV, because kids in white schools did not have color TVs. And that was where people were making the connection, not with the generic slogan about equality, that might not actually resonate with them in a very direct way. So thinking about how you frame a human rights demand is really important because quite often we frame it in ways that are unnecessarily theoretical or conceptual which does not connect with people's day-to-day -day experience. The second challenge that I reflect on is how to deal with surveillance and repression more generally. I often think that in fact how different the struggle against apartheid would have been if we had Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, uh, internet and so on, because the reality is uh, information is power. And that is something that governments that try to control or even corporations that try to control understand exceptionally well, that information is power. Now, uh, we used to jokingly say in those days, just because you're paranoid does not mean that they're not out to get you. Now, the right balance between being vigilant on the one end and being paranoid on the other hand is not as easy uh, a balance to find, but it's important that we recognize that uh, those with power who use repression are trying to intimidate us into fear and into inaction. And we should not allow ourselves to reach the point of paranoia. But on the other hand, we also have a responsibility to be thoughtful, strategic, uh, and to minimize the levels of invasion that comes with surveillance. And as we have heard through WikiLeaks, Edwin Snowden and others, that in fact we are increasingly having to deal with the question of uh, state surveillance. But the lesson I would take again from the apartheid struggle experience is that while on the one hand you have to take it into account, you really should be careful that you do not get into a position where taking into account means significantly censoring yourself or significantly um, constraining what you choose to do or not do. The third issue that I'd like to speak about is the importance of alliances. Uh, it is critically important that we recognize today that unless we are able to galvanize significant numbers of people who visibly support our demands, that those with power are unlikely to actually take us as seriously as is necessary. If I look at climate change, the, the biggest challenge we face, and you know, climate change has to today be an issue that all of us take up, whether we're in the human rights community, the peace community, the economic rights community, and so on, because it is totally a cross-cutting issue. And when we look at how, in fact, uh, we are so far away from where the science says we need to be and where extreme weather events are saying we need to be and where our politicians and business leaders are, we have a challenge of how do we um, accelerate uh, our advocacy, how do we intensify our pressure and so on. And when you face repression, when you face uh, difficult operating environments, uh, 
building strong civil society alliances are critically important. Now, sometimes building alliances actually takes a lot of work, effort and energy, and sometimes that dissuades us from investing in it. But I do think that in a context of increasing repression, which we are likely to continue to face as we see resources shrinking in the world, it's going to be critically important that we get smarter at how we actually build good ways of building alliances that aggregate power and make it harder for those with uh, decision-making authorities in government or business, making it harder for them to ignore the legitimate demands that environmentalists, human rights activists and so on make. Now, you might be familiar with the statistic that comes out of Global Witness that says every week two environmental activists somewhere in the world gets killed. Uh, these are often people who might not necessarily describe themselves as environmentalists, but they're fighting around very basic resource issues. Uh, they are indigenous peoples, foreign dependent communities, and so on. And in the context of what we are facing, I also think there is a challenge that we need to connect the different demands of different movements and find the right intersections between the different issues. Because one of the things that we learned during the anti-apartheid struggle was a wisdom from the women's movement where they gave us a very powerful concept but a somewhat uh, cumbersome word. And the word is intersectionality where the women's movement said if you want to advance gender equality you needed to understand how gender interacted with race, class, ability, religion and so on. And we need to get better at doing that because unless different movements who are largely pushing for the same things but are specialized in particular areas understand better where our different agendas start and end and where the agendas intersect with other uh, demands for justice. Better understanding that and developing campaigning strategies that actually speak to that I also believe gives you a better chance at ensuring that we are able to get our governments to respond much faster. The last issue that I want to reflect on is the whole issue of non-violence and non-violent direct action, civil disobedience and the question of sometimes the justifiability or not of armed struggle. Now it's important that we, well on the one hand, we can recognize what is established in international law, which is the right of people to defend themselves, especially people living under occupation and so on. However, having said that, my experience from the limited use of what was called armed struggle in South Africa at that time, on balance in retrospect I would say that the risks and the downsides of using um, such activities uh, actually are far uh, too costly in terms of the aftermath, in terms of the long-term consequences. I believe that while those in power will continue to increase and intensify the use of violence, if those of us who are resisting have the capability to resist the sometimes justifiable feelings of the fact that those that have the power to make change actually are obsessed with violence, but if we can resist that and take the higher moral high ground and sometimes, yes, absorb greater levels of risks, I believe that that gives our struggles much more legitimacy, much more possibility for us to actually get our message across. I have seen repeatedly where peaceful protests organized through a lot of effort where in fact sometimes because the government sends agent provocateurs consciously to try to inculcate violence and sometimes where it happens more sporadically that the message gets completely lost. So while it might sound like an unrealistic message at this time of increasing violence on the part of governments and government agencies and surveillance and so on, I think that the right ethical choice for us to make now is at two levels. On the one hand we have to say that we want to create a world where human rights and justice is respected and we want to create that world solely through fighting through peaceful means. However, fighting through peaceful means does not mean that we have to be timid, that we have to be uh, uh, lacking in confidence and, and lacking in courage because the reality is that
we must now intensify peaceful civil disobedience, including risking uh, breaking of unjust laws and so on, and to bear the consequences of that, because that has the moral authority to push our struggles forward. Now, I want to conclude with the wisdom from Nelson Mandela. President Mandela once said, Courage is not the absence of fear, but the ability to overcome that fear. In fact, I would argue that if you're engaged in civil disobedience and so on, if you don't have a measure of fear, it's probably not healthy. Having a measure of fear is probably a good thing, but not allowing that fear to actually interfere with the need to have the kind of moral courage that the kinds of injustices we see in the world today calls upon all of us. And my experience from South Africa is that change becomes possible when ordinary people believe that change is possible. Let me say that again. Change becomes possible when ordinary people believe that change is possible. And the challenge for us is to also remember that when you start off a struggle, as the, one of the founders of Greenpeace, Bob Anta put it, and Nelson Mandela also said it in a different way, where essentially they said big change always seems impossible when you start, but seems inevitable when you finish. And if we can cling on to that, because often in our day-to-day -day lives, we uh, find ourselves in a situation where we feel that we're never going to win, that things are very difficult and so on. But as history shows us, when people believe in the causes that they are pursuing, believe in the fundamental justness of that cause, and exhibit moral courage, victory is not only certain, but is also something that we can plan on the basis of uh, ensuring that these issues will be ones that prevail. So my wish to all of you attending this Connect Us International Colloquium is we have to find always the right balance from learning from history but not being slavish to history and also recognizing that lots has changed, the social media environment has changed and so on. So we need to be thinking of how do we take the best from what historical campaigning and struggles for justice teach us on the one end, but also how do we embrace the new, the innovative and the changing. I wish you a wonderful colloquium and hope to hear the outcomes of your important event. Thank you very much.